There are many of us in the body of Christ today who believe that Jesus is coming soon. We know we're at the end of the age. We see the signs that we're supposed to see indicating that his return is near, even at the door. And yet, there seems to be so much confusion still in the body of Christ. And so how do we handle this confusion? Are we doomed to this until Jesus comes? Is this the state of the body of Christ until then? Or could it be possible that God is going to bring fresh revelation? Not new revelation, but just a restoration of revelation that the early apostles had. And this will be accomplished before Jesus returns. That would be awesome. Now, it's been the cry of my heart too. And as I've sought the Lord on this, uh, I believe that one of the things he showed me as to how we can come to the real view, not our pet view or someone else's view, but what does the Bible really teach? What does Jesus know about his coming? And can we know that? And so the first thing I believe he showed me was that uh, end time prophecy can be uh, much like a jigsaw puzzle. And so the Bible is the box, the pieces are in the box, they're all scattered around, they don't come pre-assembled, and there is no picture on the puzzle box so that we can see what his coming should look like. So we're building this picture um, with the help of the Holy Spirit, and I knew that that example was powerful because it shows us that no one prophecy, no one piece says it all, that you can't see the puzzle with just having a few pieces in place, and if you get the wrong pieces, join to others, then you're off on the wrong track. And so I knew there had to be another part of it. Now, I believe that that other part of it is that instead of looking for pieces with matching colors and shapes, we're looking for key words and key phrases and metaphors, symbols that the Holy Spirit intentionally interjected in his word. It becomes obvious once you realize what he was doing. And then we make the connections um, like a circuit from one spot to another. And this uh, series of connections will enable you to, in effect, put the pieces together. It's the same thing as putting the jigsaw puzzle pieces together. And when you put enough of them together, you get a better and better view of what the picture should look like. If you build enough of them, you'll get a really good understanding of what the view looks like. And that's what we're attempting to do with the Lord's return. And I realized that Paul, in particular, in his two letters to the Thessalonians, really provided all of the prophetic connections that we need to make in order to fully understand the Lord's return. It's like a road map, if you will that when followed takes us to all of the key passages we need to visit in order to understand the full scenario of events that happen when Jesus comes again. And it will answer our questions, whether there's a secret coming, whether there's um, two or just one second coming, and what happens when he does come. Is that the end? If it's the end of the age, is that when the Antichrist and the false prophet are destroyed? Or is there... Um, Another way of understanding these things, does the real picture show us a different scenario? So just hold on and please listen to the entire video. Um, it will clear up, I believe, questions and debates that we have had for many, many centuries. Now, as I was thinking about this, I realized that Paul gave us the essential connections or the strategic connections um, that will take us to these other scriptures. And these other scriptures we're going to look at, um, besides 1 Thessalonians 4, is really it's quite simple. It's Zechariah 14 and then it's Revelation chapter 12. These three passages, when put together, tell us a lot about how the Lord comes and what happens. Uh, so I realized that here, here are his uh, strategic connections. First of all, he's talking about the coming of the Lord. So there's no doubt he's assigning everything he's saying to the subject of the second coming of Christ, his coming. And first of all, he linked his coming with resurrection. 
Of course, because when he comes, he raises the dead. And those of us who are alive and remain when that happens will also be changed in a twinkling of an eye to immortality so that what is left is that everyone who has believed on him since he first came is now in a glorified immortal body like his. So that's the first connection, resurrection. And then the second connection is what I call this harpazo event, which is where we are seized, which is what the word harpazo means, seized, snatched, caught away or up, and we are gathered together to the Lord. So that's the second connection. The first is resurrection. The second is what I like to call that when he comes, there is this harpazo event or gathering. And then third, and this is extremely important, he also connected the coming of the Lord with a prophetic thousand-year day. I didn't say a pathetic day. I said a prophetic day. So the concept was what Peter revealed and told us, don't forget this one thing when uh, you're thinking about the Lord's coming. And this one thing is that, uh, prophetically speaking, God views one prophetic day of, uh, as being a thousand years to us. So we have a thousand years that lapse, and he calls that one prophetic day. Now, that's important because he has designed the plan of redemption to span one week of prophetic thousand-year days. So we have seven thousand years, or seven days. That's significant because uh, this week is broken up to four days for the Old Testament era, and then three last days that complete the week. That's the true definition of the last days. That's why the church has always lived in the last days. The last days actually began with the ministry of Jesus 2,000 years ago. Now this last day of the last days is indeed the seventh from Adam. So it's this last day of the great prophetic week. That's important because Jesus assigned resurrection. That's the link with his coming because he said he would raise up those who believe on him, when? At the last day. That's so significant. This is a connection that you need to always make when you're talking about the coming of the Lord. And that is that it occurs as this last day begins. Officially, this last day is called the day of the Lord. So it's the day of the Lord, it's his day, and it has a variety of titles, such as the day of Christ, the day we see approaching, and so forth. Now, that means that the rapture, the first element, and then this harpazo event, the second element, are connected with this last day, the day of the Lord. So you can't have him come without this day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, Paul said, comes like a thief in the night. But we know Jesus also comes as a thief in the night. How can that be? Because both events happen at the same time. His coming and the beginning or the start of this last seventh day. Now that's a critical connection. And we need to tie in. In other words, whenever you see the day of the Lord, you're also looking at the coming of the Lord and this harpazo event, the gathering, whether or not that particular passage specifically says so. It might not be the picture that's on that piece, but when you join it with a piece that's next to it that's showing you the same part of the puzzle, that piece does mention it, so they connect. You see what I mean? This is how this view builds. So whenever you see the day of the Lord, you're also looking at his coming. You're also looking at what we come to call the rapture. And if you see his coming or the rapture or resurrection, you're also looking by extension, whether or not it's stated at this great day, the start of it, the day of the Lord. Now, finally, there's one last piece, really, that Paul gave us in these two chapters, four and five. And this last piece has to do with uh, the invasion of Israel at the end of this age by the Antichrist. Now, Here's how Paul said it. Um, he continued after describing the coming of the Lord in chapter 4, and then he opens what to us is another chapter, but to him was a continuous thought by saying, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, 
you have no need that I should write to you. In other words, I've told you when these things happen. For you know yourselves perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So obviously, Paul connected the coming of the Lord, the resurrection of believers, and uh, this Harpazo event with this day. And also, he revealed that as this day uh, is at hand and comes close to happening, what's going to happen is that there is this invasion of Israel. They are the ones who do not escape. They are the ones that cry out peace and safety and then sudden destruction comes upon them like labor pains. So this unique metaphor of using a woman's labor pains and a birth and linking it to this invasion of the nation of Israel at the end of this age by the Antichrist and his coalition of nations, which we know are the Ten Kings, that we know that this is connected with this whole series of events. So in another video, we found that actually as this invasion initially begins and they get close to Jerusalem, then God turns out the heavenly lights. He darkens the sun, moon, and stars. The sun is black as sackcloth of hair. The moon is blood red, and the starlight is diminished. And this happens all over the world. So this temporarily halts everything that's going on. And so this invasion, um, nothing on earth continues. Ha everything stops as the heavenly realm in, in this gross darkness is suddenly revealed and parted um, and everyone sees the Lord coming. Now, just because you see him coming doesn't mean you're going to go up in the rapture. It's only those who are looking for him, eagerly looking for him, that he will appear a second time with salvation. That's the key. He will appear with salvation. To the others, he will just appear. This invasion is uniquely linked to this metaphor of a pregnant woman. That's important because... That metaphor then, whenever we see it appear in other passages, such as we do in Joel or Jeremiah um, and Zechariah, so forth, and we see this metaphor, Revelation 12, big one. When we see this metaphor, we know that this is a true link, a true connection that Paul wanted us to make from 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 to these other passages. So, Let's just do this first. Let's just make sure we're on the same page because in the book of Revelation, we have a vision and it's important that you understand that this vision connects with uh, what Paul was talking about. And here's why, because he expressed this metaphor with a pregnant woman. And here in Revelation 12, we see the same thing. It opens with a great sign, which is a woman clothed with the sun, moon, and stars under her feet. Um, that's the a symbol of the nation of Israel. And being with child, she cries out in labor and pain to give birth. And then there's another sign. And the two signs together let us know that this is not a stroll down memory lane where we're looking at the ascension of Jesus nearly 2,000 years ago as if this is a past event and we're just seeing it again. No, we're seeing an event that is yet to come from our point of view here in 2022. And that's because uh, this woman representing the nation of Israel is going to have and experience these birth pains, this invasion, as we near the end of this age, the end of the sixth day of uh, from creation. And break into or transition into the seventh day, which is the day of the Lord, which is when he comes. So this end time invasion can't be any other invasion that's ever happened or what. It has to happen in conjunction with this seventh day. For us in 2022, that's going to happen no later than the end of this decade and probably a few years before. So for us, it's like maybe six, seven years away. Now, we know that this is an end-time future event because the next thing we're shown in this 
is this fiery red dragon. But it's not just a representation of Satan because the additional symbols provide us more. It says that there are seven heads on this dragon and ten horns. And so that we don't have to wonder, if you just flip to the next chapter, chapter 13 in Revelation, you realize that we're told who this is. It is the end time beast, this Middle Eastern coalition of ten nations, ten kings that give their authority and power to the beast who we would also call the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. And this is then the end time coalition of nations that will come against Israel initially. Eventually all of the nations are going to be pulled into this three and one half year war as we'll see. But this initial invasion by this seven-headed, ten-horned beast is what precipitates the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord. The resurrection of believers, this harpazo event. In fact, we can verify that because if we keep reading, we realize that the dragon is pictured as standing before the woman who was ready to give birth. So he's poised here at the end of this age to attack this woman and uh, do damage and prevent this birth. But instead, it goes on to say that then she bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Obviously, that's Jesus. Now, but is it Jesus ascending? Because it goes on to say that her child was caught up to God and his throne. So was this Jesus ascending 2,000 years ago? Or this a repeat of Jesus ascending only this time, not alone, as the firstborn from the dead, but as the firstborn among many brethren? In other words, as God's new man, with Jesus as the head, and the body of Christ, the church, as his body, the fullness of him. In other words, this would be the Harpazo event, where he brings with him those who have already gone on to be with the Lord, who sleep in Jesus. He brings them to be united with their new glorified bodies. And at the same time, after he deals with that, he then turns to us and commands us to shine. And we are instantly changed too, clothed with immortality. Then together, according to this vision, we would all ascend to the throne of God as this one new man. We'll say, well, what about the power over the nations and ruling them with a rod of iron? Well, this is what happens when <laughs> this is the promise to the overcomers, that we would share in that authority, that we would rule with him as kings and priests, that he would give us power over the nations, just like the king of Persia shared his um, authority with Esther when she stood before him in the palace and he said, Esther, what is it? You can have up to half of my kingdom. Well, we are joint heirs with Christ, right? So all of these pieces are just coming together so solidly. And here we are. He even promised that to those of us who overcome, we would sit with him in his throne, just as he overcame to sit with the Father in his. So you can't, necessarily just discount this entire vision because or by saying that this was Jesus ascending 2,000 years ago. It could just as easily, in fact, the symbolism, the connections rule that out completely and tell us we must connect this with what Paul was teaching in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5. So again, the some of the final uh, connections that connect and prove out this Revelation 12 passage is indeed about these events, um, is that we are told that this male child was caught up to God in his throne. The word caught up, guess what Greek word it is? It's harpazo, the same word that Paul used in 1 Thessalonians 4, that we who are alive and remain will be harpazo, caught up together with them. That was an intentional act of the Holy Spirit. He wanted us to make that connection. 
That word harpazo was never used of Jesus in Acts chapter 1 to explain or describe how he was taken up or went up on the day he ascended from the Mount of Olives nearly 2,000 years ago. But this word is applied for this hour because this is a different event and that's what it's designed to show. So now we see the connections and the final connection really is that when we go to Zechariah 14 and what we've studied already, but we'll go back there in a moment, is that Jesus comes down to the mountain and he splits it and then those who are in Israel, those who are in Jerusalem, what happens to them? Well, they flee through that mountain valley. That's very obviously and specifically stated by the Holy Spirit. So now we have another connection because when we look back here at Revelation 12, the same event, you see, we see that after the child is caught up to God's throne, that then the woman, the, uh, the remnant of Israel, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days, which is three and a half years. So in other words, what I'm pointing out at this moment is that there is this connection of flight. This connects with Zechariah 14. He comes, there is this invasion. It's happening as the day of the Lord is at hand. And just as the Antichrist and his armies get close to the people in Jerusalem, God halts all activities. He turns out the lights. And then he uh, really performs a second miraculous uh, miracle of salvation, whereas Moses, when they were trapped by Pharaoh and his armies, parted the Red Sea. Here, Jesus, as the Antichrist and his armies are surrounding the people and it looks like all is lost, he parts a mountain so that they can escape and be safe. So here are these connections. They are strong, they are valid, they are reliable. If you ignore them, if you discount them, if you try to build the puzzle without them, you are going to be forcing pieces where they do not belong. At best, you'll have a misconception. At worst, you'll have a false teaching. So this is the problem we've had. But here, I believe, I offer this for your consideration, that this is the answer. This is what the Holy Spirit is going to use to bring the body of Christ into the unity of the knowledge. Hallelujah. So how does this happen? Well, here's how I wrap this up. First of all, if we take this as a jigsaw puzzle and we look at the individual passages that the Holy Spirit through Paul is telling us, this is a road map. This will take you to the key passages that will tell you what you need to know about the Lord's coming. So these are the connections. So 1 Thessalonians 4, we're told, for instance, because no one peace tells us all, that Jesus descends from heaven, and then we know what happens. But we don't know what happens afterwards, and we don't know how far he descends. Does he descend down halfway? Do we go up and meet him, and then go to the Father's house, and come back later? Or do we meet him, if it's at the end of the age, supposedly, and we come back down, and we never do go to Father's house? But all we know from Paul is that he descends. We don't know how far and we don't know what happens afterwards other than that we are uh, changed, resurrected, and then harpazoed, caught together to a gathering of him. So then we must go and we must follow the roadmap to the other passage in Zechariah 14. And what Zechariah 14 tells us is that when he descends, he descends all the way down to the Mount of Olives. So even though it doesn't mention anything about the rapture, the harpazo event, it does mention the day of the Lord. So here's where the connections work for us because you can't have two days of the Lord. The day of the Lord only comes once. It comes as a thief in the night. It doesn't come over and over and over again. So these have to be the same event. That means that in Zechariah, we're looking at the day of the Lord. We know by extension 
that we're also looking at his coming. In fact, it says so at the end in chapter 12 or 14 and verse 5, it says, Thus the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with him. So it is his coming. It is connected to the day of the Lord. So these connections prove out true. And by extension, we also know, even though it doesn't say it, that this is also the Harpazo event. This is when he raises the dead and he changes us. Now, what we are not told here is what happens after he descends, other than that he splits the mountain, and we know that by extension, this is when the dead are raised, so we know that this is what Joel said, in that he will roar from Zion, that he will utter his voice from Jerusalem. We know what he must say, what he must roar. He roars, arise and shine. That's what raises the dead and changes the living into immortality. What Zechariah doesn't tell us, just like Paul only told us so much, Zechariah only tells us so much, that's why you have to put all of the pieces together. So what Zechariah does not tell us is what happens next. What happens after he splits the mountain? Does he stay and remain? Or does he go back to heaven? Reenact his ascension? Well, now all we have to do is follow the next connection that Paul told us, and he proved it out by saying you should look for the metaphor of a pregnant woman who gives birth as a, a dragon with ten heads and, or seven heads and ten horns is ready to devour her. Look for the connections. It will prove out the puzzle. In, in essence, the Bible will interpret itself. So here we are. When we go then to Revelation 12, we realize that there the scenario is finished for us because we know that once he descends to the mountain in Zechariah 14, that what happens next, just before they flee, is that he is caught up again to the throne of God, the one who is to rule all the earth. But now we know, since Paul said that once we are changed and resurrected, we will always be with the Lord. We will never leave him. We will follow him wherever he goes. So now we know that if Jesus is now going up to the throne of God, then we have to as well. That male child now is a new man uh, composed of Jesus the head, and both Jews and Gentiles, male and female, black and white, free and slave, etc. It's this new man. So now, since he's going up, we have to go up because we'll always be with him. And if we go up, then we know he's going up for the same reason. So now, by just following this roadmap that Paul gave us, I hope you're getting this. This is important. This tells us and proves out for sure whether there's these other comings and, and, and exactly what happens. So here's the scenario. First Thessalonians 4, he descends, and we know what happens. He raises the dead, etc. And there is a harpazo gathering. But we know from Zechariah 14 that when he descends, he comes all the way down to the mountain, a Mount of Olives, where from, from which he ascended the first time nearly 2,000 years ago. He splits the mountain so that the remnant in Israel can flee from the Antichrist and his armies. He doesn't stay because now he's going to reascend from Revelation 12. Now the, the connection tells us that now he's caught up back to the throne of God. So we end up at the throne of God as this age ends because it's the beginning of the seventh day, the sixth day. This age is now over. That's why Jesus promised to be with us until the end of the age through the person of the Holy Spirit. But then when this age ends, after we've completed our assignment to preach the gospel, the good news to every nation, and we will do that and then the end will come, well, now we're at the end, the end of the sixth great day and the end of this age. And he doesn't need to extend that promise any further because he knows that by the end of this age, we will be with him. So that completes this age. And what we have left is the age to come. But we now know that the Antichrist and the false prophet are not destroyed at that moment. They're not destroyed when Jesus comes as we have often thought and been told. He's not destroyed at the Great Supper of God until three and a half years later. We know this because the vision in Revelation 12 
clearly depicts the Antichrist, the dragon, as persecuting the woman and making war with the rest of her offspring for the next three and one half years after the male child has been caught up at the end of this age. Now that turns end time prophecy upside down because we have always been taught that this age ends with the destruction of the Antichrist. That means that the treading of the Antichrist uses up the first three and one half years of the thousand years of this last day. But we're not down here on the earth when we're doing it. We're up in Father's house because heaven is our throne. The earth is our footstool. And so he's putting everything under our feet. So we basically use the first three and one half years to fulfill what the disciples understood to be called the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. They asked him, Lord, will you at this time, when you ascend, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? They didn't know that it wouldn't be at this time when he ascends, but it will be when he reascends 2,000 years later, that that will start the process. That will be our next assignment. No wonder that Ephesians tells us that when God raised Jesus from the dead, he was given a name above every name. But don't stop there. The sentence continues. He was given a name above every name, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Why in the age to come would that be important? Because in the age to come, there are still enemies. The last enemy to be destroyed at the end of the thousand years is death itself. That's the picture that we were meant to see when we rightfully put the puzzle together as he intended. So even though we do not have a secret rapture coming that could happen at any moment, we do have one second coming it does occur at the end of this age, as Jesus said, and yet it still is a rapture event in which we are taken up to the Father's house, and it happens before the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, the wrath of God in that day, the destruction of mystery Babylon, on and on, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, we miss it all. So think of it like this, a secret rapture coming, no longer scriptural, we lost nothing. We didn't need it anyways. The real second coming is all we need. As far as seeing the Antichrist rise, big deal. So we see him rise, take his place on the world stage. His prophetic career, his three and one half years, means nothing to us, we're not here. In fact, we're caught up to deal with this wicked Haman and save our people just like Esther did for such a time as this. And we will continue to reign from the Father's house and we will not return until we come back with Jesus in a heavenly city, our home, in which we come back into a new heavens and a new earth.